tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you Escape. Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight, we escape to pre-war Paris and the terrifying experience of a young English girl who is the victim of a gigantic conspiracy of silence, as Alexander Walcott tells it in his version of the legend, The Vanishing Lady. cup of tea, Bruce? No, thank you, my dear. I think I'll just have a Johnny Walker and soda and take a look at the evening standard. I'd like another, please, Mother. Oh, all right, Alice. Uh, 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 only one sugar, dear. We must watch our figures. Oh, nonsense. A growing girl like Alice needs plenty of sugar. See, Mother? Daddy approves. Perhaps, but Mother is still boss. Yes, Mother. <laughs> she certainly is, Alice. <laughs> Mother? Yes, dear? I've been thinking. Yes, dear? I've been thinking about my grandparents. Oh? I know all about Daddy's parents. How Grandfather Stanley commanded a dreadnought at the Battle of Jutland, and how... Oh, it was not a dreadnought, Alice. It was a heavy cruiser. Oh, a heavy cruiser. And he got the VC. And how Grandmother Stanley was a volunteer nurse at Westwall Arch when the Zeppelins came over. And I know about your father, too. And how he died in India from his wounds. And how gallant he was at the Khyber Pass. But, Mother... Yes, dear. You never told me anything about Grandmother Winship. I... I haven't. No, and I'd like to know something about... And a child 16, I think it's time she knew. But, Bruce... And you'd probably feel better to get it off your chest. What, Mother? What is it? Well, my dear, I've never talked about your grandmother because... Well, I... I've always half believed that someday, somehow, she would come down our garden walk and, and... I I know it sounds silly, but explain where she has been for the last 20 years. Why? What happened to her? I don't know. I don't suppose I ever will. Well, now, Cynthia, darling, if it's going to upset you... No, 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 Bruce, you're quite right. It would be best to get it off my chest, as you put it. Alice, as you know, I was born and brought up in India. I was about your age when my father was killed in the Khyber campaign. Mother decided to leave India for good and return to her old home in Warwickshire. However, it was necessary for her to go to Paris to attend to some details of my father's estate. The great Paris exposition had just opened and the city was jammed with visitors from all over the world. You can imagine our relief when we arrived at the Grand Hotel Universel and heard the clerk say in quite understandable English, Ah, Madame and Mademoiselle Winship, welcome, welcome. You will please to sign the register, here and here. Oh, you have our reservations. Indeed, yes. And you are most fortunate, madame, that you telegraphed, for I have reserved for you the last room in the house. Oh, I'm so relieved. Here, Cynthia, you may as well learn now to sign a register for yourself. Oh, yes, Mama. Where do I write? There, on that line. Oh, yes, I see. Voila. You are fatigued from your journey, yes? I shall have the boy show you to your rooms at once. Chasseur, chasseur. Oui, oui, monsieur. Madame et Mademoiselle Winship à numéro 342 tout de suite. Tout de suite, monsieur. Uh, these are your bagages, madame. Yes, these six. Voilà le bagage, six pièces. Cynthia, you'd best carry the little one with the uh, medicine in it. Uh, yes, maman. Permettez-moi, mademoiselle. Oh, oh, thank you. I'll take that one, the little red one. Eh bien, uh, this way, ladies. Keep your eye on that porter, Cynthia. I don't trust these Frenchmen. Oh. I don't think he'll make off with our things, Mama. Oh, here's the lift. Dis donc, Emile. Troisième étage. Troisième. I do wish we could have gone straight on to Southampton. But you'd only have had to come back across the channel to see the solicitor. We really saved time this way. I suppose I mean I wish we hadn't had to come to Paris at all. It's... 
It's such a sinister place. Oh, oh Mama. Well, uh, what's your name? Yes, well, ladies, the right. 338, 340, 342. Voilà. Entrez, ladies. Oh, what a lovely big group. Oh, look, Mama. French windows. Oh, and the park out there. And that square with the statues on the it. Ladies, there's here. Uh, no, thank chose you. Uh, here. Oh, merci. Uh, thank you, ladies. Oh, Mama, it's like something out of a book. Yes, my dear, that's the trouble with Paris. It's so attractive. But underneath, it's evil. I had the furniture, the gilt clock, this lovely marble table. Oh, Mama, everything's so, 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 so French. <laughs> well, I'll be very glad to be on my way to where everything's English by this time tomorrow. Now, come away from that window and... Help me get into something comfortable there, the dear. Oh, yes. Yes, Mama. I, I don't know when I've been so tired. I, I just can't seem to catch my... Mama! Mama, what's the matter? Mama, speak to me. Oh, here. I'll get you up in the bed. There. There. Now, let me loosen your corset. Here, Mama. Here, here are the smelling salts. Breathe deeply. Mama! Oh, the telephone. I've got to get a doctor. Please hurry. Please. Oh, hello, operator. Will you please send a doctor up to room number... Let me see. Number 342. Pardon? Qu'est-ce que mademoiselle Daisy? Will you please send a doctor to room, room number 342? Je ne comprends pas. Qu'est-ce que mademoiselle Daisy? A doctor, please. A doctor. Ah, oui, un docteur. Oui, mademoiselle, tout de suite. I'm quite sure it was not long, although it seemed like an eternity before the doctor arrived, accompanied by the manager of the hotel. To my great relief, the doctor spoke English. He felt Mother's pulse, took her temperature, did the usual things that doctors do, and then he turned to the tail-coated hotel manager. La jeune femme parle le français. Pas un mot. Vous en êtes sûr? Absolument. Alors, je peux parler à mon aise. Monsieur, si c'est une affaire très sérieuse... N'ayez pas l'air effrayé lorsque je vous mettrai au courant. Cette femme est atteinte de la peste. Elle n'a qu'une heure à vivre. Je n'ai pas besoin de vous dire que, si cela se sait, votre hôtel perdra tous ses clients. Mon Dieu, non seulement l'hôtel, mais tout Paris se videra si la nouvelle se reprend. L'exposition... While they talked in this language, I couldn't understand. I looked from one face to the other, trying to read from their expressions how serious my mother's illness was. But they were as casual as though they were ordering dinner. Finally, I could stand it no longer. They must... Oh, please, you... You must tell me. What's the matter with her? Mademoiselle, uh, your mother is in, yes. Uh, seriously, ill. Uh, it is a collapse. Uh, due perhaps to the strain of traveling, however, a week or two of absolute rest uh, will work wonders. A week or two? Well, we were to go on to England tomorrow. Oh, 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 that would be out of the question, mademoiselle. She cannot be moved for at least several days. Right now, she must have complete rest. The next 24 hours will be critical. Oh, Mama. Poor Mama. Now, 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 mademoiselle, you must not break down too. Mm. I, I need your help. Oh, yes, yes, of course, doctor. Immediately, I need some medicine. Uh, will you fetch it for me? Why, yes, but... Uh, malheureusement, I, I must not leave your mother for a moment during these critical hours. Uh, here. Uh, I will write down this address and a little message to my wife. Your wife? Yes, I have the medicine already prepared at my home. It will be faster to go there for it than to a pharmacy. There are very few chemists who have the ingredients. But uh, couldn't you telephone? Alas, I have no telephone. But voilà. Voilà, here is the address, 24 bis rue Valgrasse. And here is the message to give to my wife. But... Doctor, I don't know Paris at all. I, I'm a total stranger here. I'm sure the manager here will give the necessary instructions to the taxi man. But certainly, if mademoiselle is ready. Before I quite knew what was happening, I was seated in a rickety taxi cab outside the hotel with the doctor's message clutched in my hand while the hotel eh manager gave voluble plus, directions to the cab driver. tel que vous pourrez vous acheter un taxi tout neuf. Maintenant, souvenez-vous, Prenez la route la plus longue. Conduisez le plus lentement possible. 
sous aucun prétexte. Ne la ramenez pas ici avant deux heures. Compris Ben oui, je comprends. Bon. It is arranged, mademoiselle. Jacques is one of our most trusted chauffeurs. He will get you to the doctor's house and back in safety. Oh, thank you so much, sir. And, and you'll look after my mother, won't you? But of course. Of that, you may be sure. Allez-y. Entendu. Je suis sur la piste. When we left the hotel, we crossed a huge square with statues around it and turned into a wide avenue which led up a gentle incline, at the top of which was a huge arch. But before long, we turned off to the right into narrower streets. It must have been 20 minutes later when we turned into another wide boulevard and I saw another huge arch up ahead. Or was it the same arch? Driver? Mademoiselle? Oh, uh, haven't we... Past that arch before? Regardez, mademoiselle. Voilà l'arc de triomphe. Voilà la tour Eiffel. Oh, uh, please, voilà I, I don't want a sightseeing tour. I want to go to this address directly, don't you understand? Now, please, take me there at once. On fait ce qu'on peut, mademoiselle. Mais soyez tranquille, donc. Elle est bien vieille, cette bagnole. <laughs> Mais elle marche. <laughs> At last, we turned into a narrow street and pulled up before a grim, grey house. The blue enameled sign on the wall read number 24 bis. I jumped out of the cab almost before it stopped, rushed up the three stone steps and pulled at the brass bell knob. Oh, hurry, hurry, hurry. Please, please hurry. Bonjour, mademoiselle. Monsieur le docteur n'est pas là. Uh, the, the doctor sent me for some medicine. Uh, here, read this, please. Retenez cette jeune femme aussi longtemps que possible. C'est de la plus grande importance pour l'avenir de Paris et même de la France. Entrez. Oh, thank you. Quand vous ne pouvez plus la faire attendre... The doctor's wife stood there reading and rereading the note as though she didn't understand it. And until I thought I would scream. Oh, please, please hurry. Get me the medicine. It's my mother. She may be dying. I, I must get back to her. Please hurry. Asseyez-vous. She pointed to a chair. Attendez. And slowly walked down the hall and closed the door behind her. I waited and waited. And wondered. About the time the cab had taken to get here. About that arch that looked so familiar. And I was torn by the hundred nameless anxieties that torture you when your nearest and dearest is ill. And then... I heard something that froze my blood. A telephone. A telephone clearly ringing somewhere in the house. The doctor had said he had no telephone. That was the reason I must come all this way for the medicine. Oh, no. No, it, it couldn't be in this house. It, it must be next door. Or across the street, of course. That's where the sound was coming from. Hello? But no. It was the voice of the doctor's wife answering the phone. Oh, no. No, what monstrous plot was this? I felt my scalp crawl with terror. My brain pounded and my head fell as though it would burst. I wanted to scream, to run out of this awful house, to run all the way across Paris to the bedside of my mother. Voilà, mademoiselle, <gasps> la médecine. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Au revoir, mademoiselle. Now, driver, please. Please, in the name of your own mother, hurry. Back to the hotel as fast as possible, please. <laughs> In just a moment, we continue with the second act of Escape. But first, no, you won't be hearing double. That'll be Groucho Marx appearing on two different CBS shows tomorrow night. First, in his own hilarious ad-lib quiz, You Bet Your Life, and then immediately following as Bing Crosby's guest. Don't miss this great meeting on CBS tomorrow night. And now we return you to Escape. I pleaded with the taxi driver. I begged him to hurry. I explained to him in tears that my mother was desperately ill. But the taxi cab never increased its speed. We crept across Paris just as slowly as we had come. Until at last, we pulled up before the entrance of the hotel. Voilà, mademoiselle. I jumped out of the cab. And then I saw the sign over the hotel entrance. It said... Hotel Ritz. Uh, 
Driver, you, you've taken me to the wrong hotel. I'm staying at the Grand Hotel Universal. Ben non, mademoiselle. Je vous ai ramassé au Ritz et je vous ramènerai au Ritz. Il y a 25 francs 50 au compteur. Uh, et j'aimerais recevoir immédiatement en plus le pourboire. Please, I, I don't understand what you're saying, but I want you to take me to the Grand Hotel Universal. Et c'est ici que je vous ai pris en charge et c'est ici que je vous ramène. Uh, et maintenant, c'est mon heure d'aller dîner. Donc, si vous aurez l'obligeance de me payer... Oh, you stupid, stupid man. Can't you understand? My mother is ill. You've taken more than two hours to get me to that doctor's house and back. Can't you understand? My mother is sick, perhaps dying. Mademoiselle, vos problèmes ne me regardent pas. Donc, si vous aurez l'amabilité de me payer le 25 francs, ça faut en plus le pouvoir... I looked around me. A small group of passers-by had stopped and were listening curiously to the argument. And then they joined in, taking sides. Everywhere I looked were foreign faces, strangers, enemies. And then, shouldering through the crowd, I saw the bareheaded young man in tweeds with a pipe clamped in his teeth. And before he had a chance to speak, I knew that help had come. Are you uh, having some trouble? Oh, thank heaven, an Englishman. Yes, that's right. Now, what seems to be the matter? I told him rapidly as I could. And he paid the mulish cab driver. Merci, Merci. Popped me into another cab, and five minutes later... We walked into the lobby of the Grand Hotel Universel. The manager was behind the desk. Uh, please, my mother, is she all right? Uh, I beg your pardon? M my mother, Mrs. Winship in 342, is she all right? There is no Madame Winship in 342. What? 342 is occupied by Monsieur Auguste Noray, a permanent guest. Oh, please, don't you remember me? I'm Cynthia Winship. Two hours ago, you put me into a taxi to go to the doctor's house for some medicine for my mother. No, oh, I'm afraid mademoiselle is mistaken. I have never seen her before in my life. Well, now, look here. What is this? No, listen, I swear to you, it is as I say. We signed the register less than three hours ago. We got in on a train from Marseille. Well, now, let's have a look at the register. Oh, yes, yes. I'll show you. I'm in 342. Where is the register? It is here, mademoiselle. You may see for yourself. See, today's date. Fourteen guests registered, but I don't see any mademoiselle or madame Winship. Do you? But... But... This is, is monstrous. It's impossible. My mother is somewhere in this hotel. What have you done with her? What have you done with her? Now, how do you feel, Miss Winship? Better, thank you. The... Soup was very nourishing. Well, won't you have something else? A salad or a bit of uh, roast? No, no, thank you. Just a, a cup of tea, perhaps. Why, well, yes, certainly. Garçon. Monsieur. Une tasse de thé pour mademoiselle. Tout de suite, monsieur. I... I don't know how to thank you, Mr... Do you realize I, I don't even know your name? <laughs> well, it, it, it's Bruce. Bruce Stanley. I'm glad to meet you, Mr. Stanley. Well, it's a pleasure, Miss Winship. Mr. Stanley... You believe me, don't you? Oh, of course I do, Miss Winship. We did register at that hotel. We were in room 342. Why, uh, I can even describe the furnishings. There was a big window that went from the, the ceiling to the floor. Um, every hotel room in Paris has windows like that, Miss Winship. Oh, they do? Yes. Oh. Well, in this room, the draperies were plum-colored... And there was a, a marble top table, black marble it was, and a, a gilt clock it had run down. The hand stopped, I remember, at, at 20 minutes past three. The walls were covered in, in rose brocade, and, and the bedspread was a washed-out yellow. Oh, if I could only get into that room, you'd see that I'm not making this up. No, I, I'm sure that you're not. And, and perhaps I can find a way to make them let you in the room. You can? Yes. Well, see, I'm with the embassy, well, uh, <laughs> under secretary sort of thing. I believe that the British Empire has enough influence to change the mind of an obstinate Paris innkeeper. Well, then let's do it right away. Oh, well, I'm afraid the might of Britain can't move that fast. It's past dinner time. But tomorrow we shall see. Tomorrow? Oh, but I, I must get in that room tonight. I have no money and no way to sleep. Well, we can do nothing with the people at the hotel. Uh, you saw that. Uh, we, we'll just have to be patient until tomorrow. And I, I'm sure that I can find a room for you tonight in the pension near the embassy. You're, you're so very kind. 
How can I ever thank you, Mr. Stanley? Uh, you, uh, you might begin by calling me Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you, Cynthia. Oh, oh! Well, what is it? I've just thought of something. The doctor. The doctor? Yes, the, the one the hotel manager brought in to look after Mother. I still have his address somewhere here in my bag. Uh, just a minute. Yes, here it is. Oh, we must go there immediately. He, he can tell us about Mother. Hmm, 24 bis Rue Valdegras. Well, that's not far. That's just off the Boulevard Raspail. It's near the Gare Montparnasse. Well, how long would it take to get there by taxi? Oh, about ten minutes. But it took over an hour this afternoon. <laughs> Voila, monsieur, 24 bis rue Valgrasse. Well, here we are. Yes, yes, this, this is the place. Uh, attendez une minute. D'accord. Hmm? The house is dark. Yes, well, it, it, it's quite late. Well, I don't care. We've got to find out tonight. Qui est en bas? Where is he? Oh, he's uh, there at the upstairs window. Hmm. Uh, monsieur le docteur, c'est mademoiselle Winship. Elle veut vous questionner de sa mère. Je connais pas de Mademoiselle Winship. He says he doesn't know you. But he must, he, he must. Uh, doctor, don't you remember? This afternoon, you, you, you sent me here to your house for medicine for, for my mother. Je comprends pas l'anglais. And he says he doesn't understand English. Oh, the liar, the liar, he does. He speaks perfect English. Ah, jeune ami, je vous conseille de me pas déranger de sommer des gens respectables. Et de vous en aller avant que j'appelle la police. Ah, oh, I... Sorry, Cynthia. Oh, Bruce, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? If it hadn't been for Bruce, I'm certain I should have gone out of my mind that dreadful night. He found a room for me at the pension near the embassy, where I spent a sleepless night. I tossed and turned and worried myself in an agony almost beyond endurance. Where was my mother? What had they done with her? Bruce called for me at half past ten the next morning and took me back to the hotel. To my surprise, the attitude of the manager had changed completely. But of course, mademoiselle may inspect room 342. We are only too glad to convince mademoiselle that her mother is not and never was in the Grand Hotel Universel. Why, I never... I personally will escort you to the room. This way, please, to the ascenseur. Oh, Bruce, that terrible man, that horrible, horrible... Shh, now, Cynthia, don't let him upset you. Monsieur. Troisième étage. Troisième, monsieur. Now, Bruce, remember what I told you last night. You'll see. Plum-colored draperies, black marble top table, rose walls, and a gilt clock with hands stopped at 20 minutes past three. You will see. Yes, Cynthia. Voilà. Troisième. This way... Mm. It was room 342 you wished to see, mademoiselle. Yes, that's right. Third door to the right. So, here we are. Oh, you see, Bruce, I, I know where it is. Yes, my dear. Voila. Enter, please. Now, Bruce, now you'll see the yellow bedspread. Oh. Not quite the room you just described in the elevator, mademoiselle. The drapes are royal blue. No. Oh. A hey, little dusty, I fear. I must have this room renovated. There uh, is no marble top table. No. Uh, the clock, as you notice, is running. No. Mm. Ah, and right on time, it seems. The walls are not rose brocade, but yellow flower no. wallpaper. Now, my dear mademoiselle, you see how thoroughly mistaken... No! 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 They had tried to make me think I was mad. They succeeded. I remembered nothing until I awoke in my aunt's house in England two weeks later. Thanks to Bruce, who never left my side during those terrible days when my sanity hung in the balance. Well, Alice, that's the story. And that's why I've never been able to talk to you about your grandmother, Winship. Oh, Mother, how horrible. Because 
all these years, I've clung to the foolish hope that somehow she'd come back and tell us herself what happened. You poor dear. You may as well dispel that hope forever, Cynthia. What? Well, since you've at last brought yourself to discuss your mother's disappearance, I, I think it's time you knew the true facts. Bruce. Your mother died 20 minutes after you left the hotel on that fool's errand with the doctor. Oh, no. Yes, she, she died of the bubonic plague. <laughs> She'd caught it in India before she sailed. The doctor recognized the symptoms the moment he examined her. He told the hotel manager in French, in your presence. They agreed that the matter must be kept completely secret. If the news leaked out that there was a case of plague in Paris, the city would have been emptied of visitors and the exposition would have been a failure. Oh, Bruce. Uh, the conspiracy of silence began in the hotel. The bellboy was paid to claim he never saw you. The taxi driver was paid to take you to the doctor's house by the most roundabout route. The note to the doctor's wife advised her to detain you as long as she could. And the taxi driver added his own imaginative touch by returning you to the Ritz instead of the Universelle. I shudder to think what might have happened if I hadn't come through the Place Vendôme just then. But you didn't know. Not then. When did you find out? The next morning. By then, the conspiracy had grown to international proportions. The embassy had been advised. If, if the exposition was a failure, the franc would fall and the pound sterling would be affected, that, that sort of thing. I knew when we went back to the hotel, you would not find your plum drapes and rose-colored walls and black marble-topped tables. And you let me go through with that? What could I do, Cynthia? I was acting under orders. I knew that the hotel had completely fumigated and redecorated the room overnight, and everything was in readiness to repudiate your story. I had to let the last act of that dreadful farce play to its dreadful end. What did they do with Mother? Her body was removed from the room less than 30 minutes after you left it and immediately burned. Mm. Why? Why didn't you tell me years ago? Why did you let me go on all this time? This is the first time that you have ever mentioned your mother since then, my dear. Alice. Yes, Mother? Uh, there's a, a new issue of the Tatler in the library. Wouldn't you like to look at it? But, Mother, I want now, to know dear, about... Now, dear, there's a good girl. I want to have a talk with your father. <laughs> Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson. Tonight we have presented The Vanishing Lady by Alexander Wolcott, freely adapted for radio by Mr. Robeson. Featured in the cast were Joan Banks as Cynthia, Ben Wright as Bruce, Anthony Ross as the doctor, and John Hoyt as the hotel manager. Also heard were Irene Tedrow, Ramsey Hill, Nan Boardman, Daphne O'Callaghan, and Paul Fries. Special music was composed and conducted by Del Castillo. <laughs> Next week. You are in command of an English destroyer sailing to join the North Sea Patrol in October 1914 when destiny forces you to become the man who won the war. Next week, we escape with one of the classic stories of the First World War. Robert Buckner's famous and unforgettable tale, The Man Who Won the War. Goodbye, then, until this same time next week, when once again we offer you Escape. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.